in, in Lansing, we don't have too much uh, Q1 food. And I think that is a good idea to uh, make a business of Q1 food. You'll find Johanna Ferra's Habana Delights food truck in Lansing's Old Town, living her dream three years now. Well, when did you come from Cuba? In 2014. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Well, I think the story, particularly when you look statewide for the state of Michigan, is just how diverse this state is and how diverse the international community is. I'm so happy for make uh, this kind of sandwich. I came with my husband and two child, and they become so good, the good uh, future for them. But Michigan's future? We've got a population problem. Here's demographer Kurt Metzger. And so what we have seen in, in 2020 was the first time the deaths outnumbered births. Immigration is the only way we're gonna grow our population. We have always gained population through what we call natural increase, which is births over deaths. That's always been a driver of population growth. In addition, we've had immigration and, you know, fairly significant, not, not great numbers, but, but the state averaging somewhere around 18 to 20,000 immigrants uh, a year, plus, plus some movement from secondary coming to other parts of the country and coming to Michigan. But we've always been what we call an out-migrant, domestic out-migrant state. We always send more people away than we bring in. Steve Tabachman leads Global Detroit, an advocate for immigrants in our communities. Immigration in Southeast Michigan and across Michigan, just like other parts of the middle part of the country, um, have really been a great benefit and an untold story over the last 20 years. Why is it untold? I would think there's a lot of people that want to talk this up. This is an attraction to try to build the economy around here. Well, I mean, you need only look at um, who has been coming to Michigan over the last 20 years. And uh, particularly since 2010, we know that more than 50% of the adult arrivals who are immigrants to the state of Michigan have a four-year college degree or higher. That's roughly twice the state average. And so this is a highly educated community. I mean, it also includes working class folks as well. But yet, we went through a national debate about five years ago, it was uh, central to the presidential campaign uh, that painted a picture of immigration that is very different from the reality that communities experience. When Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're not sending you. They're not sending you. Just one presidential term ago, Donald Trump proclaimed his southern wall would save thousands of lives from an onslaught of undocumented criminals, a problem statistically unfounded. Unfortunately, about five years ago, um, as we were resettling uh, a lot of new refugees from uh, the Middle East, particularly Syria, and there were some attacks in Europe, uh, suddenly this issue flipped. Terrorists attacked Paris in 2015, killing more than 100. Trump brought on the so-called Muslim ban, restricting immigration from certain countries. There were protests, but Steve Tabachman says the damage was done. That kind of anti-Muslim ban and rhetoric really sent a signal across the world. And as a result, uh, some folks decided they would go somewhere else. They would go to Canada, they would go to Europe, they would go to Australia or other places that are actually benefiting from attracting uh, global capital, global workers, talent, all of those kinds of things. Back then, Michigan, a top state in the resettlement of Syrian refugees, hit a snag in Oakland County. We had tried years ago talking about Syrian refugees developing a community in Pontiac. And Brooks Patterson came out very strongly against that. Patterson, the late Oakland County executive, threatened legal action citing the Paris attacks. The refugees still came, but no go on building a community in Pontiac and suddenly people began to fear refugees. Now, the reality is that refugees um, are the most thoroughly vetted of any visitor to the United States. They go through seven international and uh, U.S. security background checks before they set foot on U.S. soil. Under Trump, refugee resettlement numbers plummeted. 
Now with the Afghans coming and Joe Biden in charge, a change underway. And what we've seen, thankfully, in this past year is a much stronger embrace and much more uh, robust uh, level of support for the new arrivals that we've gotten from Afghanistan than, say, five years ago when we shut down the border to you know, all Muslims and refugees at the beginning of the Trump administration. We have folks from Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Syria, Sudan, Eritrea, Burma, Nepal. Lansing's Refugee Development Center helps new arrivals. Okay, let's see how that goes. Erica Brown Binion leads a staff of 23 and a lot more volunteers, helping immigrants get situated. And our goal since the very beginning has been to support refugees after they arrive in mid-Michigan so that they can be successful and able to thrive here and really build roots and stick around and be part of our community. RDA began 20 years ago when Afghan refugees came here after 9-11. Now a few hundred more settling in the Lansing area, some already on the job working. We also have a really um, vibrant cultural broker team, which includes people who were once a refugee themselves and bring cultural and linguistic expertise to our team so that we are best able to connect with families and their needs. Brown Binion touts her city's welcoming reputation, offering English classes, support groups, and help for entrepreneurs like Johanna Farah with her food truck. Thank RDC, yeah. it helped me a lot. Uh, the first time because I don't know how I can do the business. There continues to be this, this idea that immigrants are going to take our jobs, immigrants are going to drive down wages, all these things, and that's certainly not, not the case. David Card. Last year, economist David Card won the Nobel Prize looking at how immigrants affect the paychecks of longtime residents. He looked at Miami 1980 when the Mario Boatlift brought an influx of new workers fleeing from Cuba. And what David Card has shown that when you isolate a labor market like the Mario Boatlift in Cuba that saw over 100,000 low-skilled Cuban workers enter the Miami labor market, is that indeed uh, other low-skilled workers actually saw their wages increase. Compare that to Steve Tabachman's own study last year here in Detroit, looking at part of southwest Detroit and the Banglatown area, where because of immigration, property values rose, vacancies and blight dropped, while new businesses emerged. Now tens of thousands of Bangladeshis are here in Hamtramck, Detroit, and beyond. At one time, the city was economically and financially was going down, but People from our community, they started opening the business, they start they creating a job, uh, opening the businesses, and actually that's helping the city at the same time we are being you know, a good citizen. And we always teach our community for the being a good citizen, contribute to the community, help the community for the better life. We've seen that kind of what the auto industry and everything has meant to, to immigrant families for centuries now. I mean, it's like when you think of the Middle Eastern community and you tend to think that these are kind of recent immigrants coming, and yet they can go back. You know, some of the Palestinian immigrants and Lebanese are going back to the 1800s. For Bangladeshis, a common East Side story, like the Poles and Italians before them, who a century ago were deemed less desirable immigrants by the federal Dillingham Commission. Some Bangladeshis came to America after World War II, a lot more more recently. That's according to Syed Hoek, who studied Bangladeshi American history. They used to live close to the Detroit downtown area. Then back 1970, they moved in Hamtramck area. Building a mosque established a community. That's why uh, the Bangladeshi American community grew up in Hamtramck and around Hamtramck. Now many have moved north, places like Macomb County, some congregating at the Islamic Center of Warren, on this day holding a COVID vaccine clinic. See him tramic. Can you see him tramic? Michigan has the second largest population of Bangladeshis 
Only New York has more. A community of factory workers, business owners, tech workers, college students. Immigrants contribute to a quarter of all the high-tech startups in America and over 50% in Silicon Valley. Uh, and they're also business owners on Main Street. They uh, own 28% of the Main Street style businesses like restaurants and grocery stores and dry cleaners. There should be kind of a coalition of these groups trying to figure out how do we attract and then how do we retain. We educate a lot of immigrants. How do we retain them after they uh, graduate? And how to get more people to move here? Nadim Shaquille just moved uh, to Warren. I just moved last summer from Atlanta. I've been living in Atlanta the last 30 years. The reason I moved here is that the community is very strong. Yes, the community is coming back. And social media actually bringing everyone together. So it's a resolving a lot of issues right now. And Michigan State is growing day by day. And, you know, have a nice, especially food are good here. Company is good, food is good, you know. <laughs> and that's what I always look for.